presentations. I'd like to welcome the Ada County Commissioners today to our first joint meeting. Thank you. With new commissioners, welcome. Um, I'm gonna uh, note for the record that we have four of the five commissioners here today. The Highway District Commissioners, Commissioner Baker is unavailable. And then if you wanna open your meeting, This is Kendra Kenyon, Ada County Commissioner, and we also have with us Diana Lachiando, Ada County Commissioner, and Rick Missouri, County Commissioner. The three of the three. Okay, so we're going to start with um, ACHD 101, presentation by Paul Regal. Commissioners, welcome. Uh, sorry you get the B team today. The uh, director is uh, unavailable, so uh, by way of agenda, I'm going to go through a quick introduction to uh, ACHD and what we do. Uh, then we're going to give you a presentation on the growth in Ada County, followed by our strategic plan and then some open discussion afterwards. Next slide, please. Our elected le leadership, uh, I know you all know each other. These are the districts that they represent. Next slide, please. So we were established in 1971. Uh, the legislation, the legislators approved a law that allowed uh, special governance. Uh, the people voted on it. It took a super majority uh, to, uh, to create us. Uh, and of note, we did better than the beer and wine sales uh, initiative that was on the ballot that year. So we feel pretty proud of that. Uh, we are governed by the five elected commissioners. Uh, they do have ordinance authority and responsible for all the local roads and bridges and uh, streets and alleyways here uh, within Ada County. A little over $3 billion worth of assets. And currently, we have almost 361 full-time employees. Uh, that we use to support the six cities and almost uh, half a million people uh, here in the Treasure Valley. Economic impact, almost $260 million a year. Uh, I'm going to show you a graphic a little later that uh, depicts that 5,000 lane miles that we have. Uh, you know, hundreds of bridges, traffic signals, cameras. Uh, we have an awful lot of stuff. Uh, we do uh, operate out of uh, a couple of locations. We have the physical headquarters here. We have the Adams Maintenance Facility across the street and out at uh, Cloverdale. Uh, we have another maintenance facility uh, over there. Uh, have uh, several gravel pits that, that we use for uh, between gravel and storage. Uh, and also commuter ride. We have a, a lab. And we have our own nuclear, uh, uh, I, I call us our own nuclear bot, but it, it measures compaction and stuff. It's a nuclear test gauge. So. We are we are new capable. Next slide. Sorry. <laughs> then, yeah. Well, the good news is you have several of us that, that used to do that in a former life, so we're we're pretty familiar with it. So standard wiring diagram, but I am going to take this opportunity to allow the staff to introduce themselves. Obviously, I am not the director; I am the chief of staff, and our general counsel. <laughs> <laughs> and nice prom queen, we, we like that. And, uh, and then uh, the executive officer over here, Stacy. No, no, Our deputy director for the newly named Development and Technical Services, Mr. Jim John Kerr. John Kerr. Mr. Wallace. Here. 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 Plans and Projects. Right. And we have somebody sitting in for the deputy director of maintenance. Wait for you. Now you're able to put some faces to the names, there'll be a test later, so next slide please. Um, one of the things that uh, in, in addition to servicing uh, the local and regional, uh, of late, the last few years, uh, there have been several folks from other countries that have come uh, through different programs to take a tour, listen to how we do things, ask us questions. Uh, it's been pretty interesting listening to folks from uh, Bhutan ask us how we do things, realizing they have one stoplight in the entire nation. So yeah, it's been very interesting to chat with some of those folks. Next slide. So ACHD's uh, road system, 5,000 lane miles. It doesn't mean much when you say that, but when you realize that that's the distance from uh, Boise, Idaho to Washington, D.C. and back, it, it gives you a, a little better perspective of just how much road that we have to maintain. Uh, 
right now our lane mile cost is a little over ten thousand uh, dollars a lane mile so over fifty million dollars a year as I said our asset value is a little over three billion dollars so we have an awful lot of uh, road to take care of next slide so we maintain improve rebuild uh, regionally we're not just a road department we collaborate with each one of the cities uh, they're the land use agencies we're the we, we help bring the transportation uh, vision into reality one of the things we're very proud of is our engagement with the public. We have an awful lot of public involvement meetings, reaching out, letting them know what our projects are all about, getting input. We pride ourselves on, uh, on being honest brokers of the people's money. Next slide. Our priorities, basically our priorities are our people, uh, followed by effective and efficient execution. We like to be uh, leaders in technology design innovation. I like to be on the leading edge, but I tell my people I don't want to be on the bleeding edge. I don't mind technology that's been tried and tested. Uh, so, uh, but we preach safety, 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 safety. Every one of our uh, employees carries this card that, that has our safety mantra on it, and anyone is allowed to stop a project at any time if they don't feel it's safe. So we have an outstanding safety record one that we're very, very proud of. Next slide. Our commitment. Our one goal from our commissioners is to maintain the taxpayer's uh, asset base. That is the one thing that we are tasked to do. How we do it? Uh, we do that by keeping the roads in, in very good condition. Our roads are assessed uh, almost every other year by an outside agency. Uh, we execute the budget at greater than 92%. We keep our bridges uh, almost in 100% perfect condition, but 99%. Uh, most of our uh, vehicles have a 99% uh, or better in service rate. We uh, maintain our arterials at a level of service E, 85% level of service E or better. Traffic signal operation is always at 99% or better. And uh, particularly important to the developers, that 25 day work round to uh, take a look at those development applications. Next slide. Do this using a two step approach. Our primary focus. This comes from our commissioners. Our primary focus, as you can see, uh, pavement, sidewalks, bridges, traffic signals, and stormwater facilities. Secondary focus, enhancement uh, for roads and intersections to, to take care of the uh, congestion. As I said, primary and secondary focus are dictated by our commissioners. Next slide. Uh, we do that under the umbrella of a 20-year strategic plan and a 20-year capital improvement plan. And we boil that down to what we call the integrated five-year plan and then as part the first two years of the integrated five-year plan are our active budget cycle so the, everything works hand in glove uh, so that uh, they all one feeds into the other and then as I said while the integrated five-year plan is a, is a rolling five-year plan the first two years are always the current budget years so, next slide state of the district so as I said, we're anal we get analyzed uh, almost every year for our payment management. And you can see the outside agency that comes in to analyze it also analyzes uh, several places west of the, of the Rockies. We have uh, been ranked number one for our uh, payment condition index for uh, a number of years and we're very proud of that. Next slide. We win an awful lot of awards. Uh, Women of the Year, we just uh, have several LTAC uh, Innovation Award winner. We have we have a couple of national awards. Excuse me, let me. The the uh, Woman of the Year, right there, Stacy. Raise your hand. She is the <laughs> WTS Woman of the Year. So, uh, we, uh, like I said, we are very proud that we are a, uh, a Silver Level Award winner for the uh, American Bicyclist. So every project we do, uh, we always take a look at. Uh, what's, you know, sidewalks we take a look at uh, bike lanes so uh, it, it's ingrained in, into the things that we do next slide uh, we give back to the community uh, last year we raised uh, a little over one hundred eighty thousand dollars for the Idaho Garden Reserve Family Support Fund uh, next slide several of us also are part of uh, Idaho Patriot Thunder which also gives back to uh, the local military community next slide people are always asking us where, where do your revenue come from and where do your expenses go? So in the year 2018, you can see right now that uh, the development and impact fees 
came from these locations. The uh, blue is the revenue, the red is expenditures, and some of it, as you'll see over time, a lot of this reflects where the growth is. Next slide. So from 2014 to 2018, you can see the graphs have shifted a little bit, but you can still see where most of the growth was. Next slide. From 2004 through 2018, over the last 18 years, you get a pretty decent snapshot over time of where the growth has been and where the money has gone. Next slide. The uh, projected jurisdictional split uh, from 19 to 23, again, uh, based on what uh, the growth is projected to be. Where does unincorporated data sit on that? I believe that part is uh, over under the unallocated. So, next slide. And again, this is uh, from 2004 to 2023. Commissioner, we can get you copies of this if you need. So, PowerPoint. Uh, yes. Sir. Thank you. You're welcome. So I should have, didn't ask you to take all those pages. No, it's just that the graph started out with Ada County, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> yes, it, it did it, switch. We got, we went away. So. <laughs> Well, it, was, it wasn't intentional, sorry. Next well, slide. Unallocated indicates that you're not spending money. So if we're lumped into unallocate, unallocated, I... We'll clarify that for you. Fair enough. Where does our revenue come from? Everybody's always asking. The majority of our revenue comes from property taxes and the highway users fund. Um, impact fees account for a little over 10% and then vehicle registration fees. But you can see the majority, property tax and highway users fund. Next slide. Uh, $130 million budget for FY19. Very proud of the fact that our overhead is only 8%. So uh, tooth to tail ratio is, uh, is pretty good. Next slide. Some of the highlights from the FY19 budgets, we uh, no increase in health insurance rates. And that's, we have a, a wellness program that's very robust. And we were really, really pleased that uh, our, our health insurance came back with absolutely no increase uh, on most agencies experience at least a, a double digit increase in some size 25 percent um, so also we are self-insured for a lot of things but our physical plant uh, is insured uh, through various insurance companies and again no rate increase there and we didn't get a rate increase in workman's comp due to our uh, really robust uh, safety program so is your health insurance self-funded the health insurance is not self-funded uh, next slide Changes, challenges on the horizon. <laughs> well, we, we had a saying in the military, some days you eat the bear, some days the bear eats you. That guy was working pretty hard to, to not have the latter. <laughs> uh, what we're gonna talk about here is some of the growth that the county is going to be experiencing. And you know, you'll see that sometimes the, the uh, operational capacity is gonna get overwhelmed, not just here, but in uh, a lot of other places. It, it's always a balancing act. Maintain, replace. You, know, you need to, to fix the infrastructure, so there's always a balancing act that you have to uh, uh, be very careful with when you start talking about revenue and expenses. Paul, sir, do you know where the picture's taken? Where the this picture's taken? The little intersection. Somebody told me once, but I, I apologize, I don't remember. But they keep teasing me that that is one of my relatives standing out there in the middle of no place. But chicken dinner is road. Perfect. Is that chicken dinner road? I guess. <laughs> it could be. It wouldn't surprise me. I have uh, and just as an aside, when my uh, brother-in-law was driving up from uh, California about eight years ago, and I was telling him how to work his way. I said, don't worry, you're gonna pass Chicken Dinner Road, you're gonna get here, you're gonna get there. <laughs> he comes to the house and he goes, I thought you were lying to me. There really was a Chicken, chicken dinner, dinner Road. road. I said, yeah, there really was. That chicken dinner morning. It's a tourist attraction. Yes, yeah, it is. So, next slide, please. Are there any questions that we can answer for you at this stage of the game? Go ahead. Question. So, I, I'm a person who really likes to kind of start high level from the mission and mission and, and you've got me there a little bit i'm looking up on your wall on your vision and mission and in terms of metrics in terms of how you're achieving that um, the main metric i heard was payment condition index and I, that is one of the metrics now when we drill down every department has a different series of, of metrics we meet monthly to go over everything to make sure that everybody is meeting their their goals so some of the some of the goals payment condition index is a is a more broad brush one. We we only look at that once a year. So, but I'm sorry, I interrupted. Go ahead. Um, and I'm also just sort of wondering when you are defining transportation in that vision and mission, 
Um, what does that entail? What, what forms of transportation are you thinking about when you define that? When, when we define transportation, we're looking at all modes of transportation. You know, not only uh, vehicles, but pets and bikes as well. So. Okay. So that would lead to different metrics. You, there's, there's a number of different ways. Now, in terms of pets and bikes, hard to measure. I mean, how, how do you measure level of service for a sidewalk? Do you, do you, you know, uh, so there's, there's certain things that lend themselves better to measurement. I mean, it's easy to say that our roads are level of service E, A, B, whatever those are, because you can physically measure that. Harder to do when you start talking in terms of bikes and pets. But we still think in terms of bikes and pets whenever we do a project. So we're looking at all modes of transport. Yes, ma'am. Um, you mentioned um, you showed a cost of um, per, I guess it was lane mile cost. Mile, yeah, how does mile. that stack up to neighboring areas and states? You know, we have asked that, and uh, it's, it's not an apples to apples comparison. Some some people don't include uh, cost of maintenance in there. Some people don't measure it at all. So I can't really answer that for you. Sir? Just for clarification, one of the reasons that I'm so grateful that we spend so much attention to maintenance because number one that's our that's our main mission uh, is it costs us less in terms of long term and overall maintenance when we keep that, those roads up to a higher PCI index if we kept them down to a 75 or 80 we'd be spending money like they do in Salt Lake and accomplishing nothing there is a, um, a statistic I heard I can't remember if it was Reno or the area around Reno, but they threw, uh, I want to say it was $51 million that we have in some of the roads and only brought it up uh, about two points. Uh, so if you can keep your roads at, at that high level, one of the reasons we do a lot of chip sealing is, gonna, is cost me 28, 28 cents a square foot to chip seal as opposed to $2.50 to rebuild the road. People so, love to hate it, but it's critical. So, so true story, when I, when my, my last duty station was Mountain Home, I was the base commander. So. I got money to repave every road on base. And everybody loved me for about six months because they were able to rollerblade and skateboard and do all that good stuff. My chief engineer talked me into chip sealing because it would last longer. They burned me in effigy after that. <laughs> but the roads do last an awful lot longer. You know, if you let the road cure right after you, you put it in and then you chip seal it, it's like putting frosting on a cake. I mean, you, you seal it in the moisture, it lasts a lot longer, uh, and, and you're, you know, you're really saving money in the long run. Any other questions before I turn it over to Gary Enselman to talk about growth? Going once, going twice. Gary, over to you. Sir. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, the director, Gary Enselman, development services manager. We'll uh, give you a brief overview of some of the growth areas in the county that we're seeing and uh, challenges that that presents. Uh, you can see uh, obviously very high activity levels, 2018, total of 5,400 residential lots, final platted, 4,600 permits. Uh, up until the last quarter of 2018, there was actually more permits than lots uh, each year, so that vacant lot inventory was shrinking um, over the last uh, three, four years until this last quarter of 18, where there was a little bit of a gain in the lots, which means we're obviously very busy with uh, new subdivisions uh, being built and platted. Uh, focus a little bit on this area of North Cuna, South Meridian, uh, west of Highway 69. Uh, this saw uh, really intense uh, development activity over the period of 2014 to 17 and last year. Over 4,300 lots of preliminary platted in that area over that four year period. Uh, on this map, you can see how the two cities are growing together in that area. Cumulative impacts of that is over 50,000 vehicle trips per day. So you can imagine we need another Eagle Road to serve that area once all of those developments uh, build out. That does not include the you know, future developments of the remaining vacant land out there that will uh, 
eventually developed under the city's comprehensive plans. Uh, with the known uh, current entitlements, that would uh, lead to 13 intersections and six roadway, roadway segments uh, projected to exceed our planning thresholds. These are the projects that we have planned out there, uh, a couple of intersections and one road segment. And the 10 mile road Overland to Victory and the 10 mile Victory intersection, we just added last year, the commission uh, asked us to go ahead and advance that to try and address some of this, some of the issues out there. That leaves uh, eight intersections and four road segments uh, that are projected to exceed our thresholds that are not programmed for construction currently in that one area. So the, the blue are the projects that are currently programmed and the red are the, and black are the uh, projected uh, roads and intersections that would exceed our, our thresholds. And then further south along Columbia and, and again an intersection of 10 mile. Uh, one of the issues we face is that uh, I don't know the development pays impact fees for our system improvements to the arterials. However, due to the vast number of projects uh, and needs, we historically lag behind in some of these areas 15 to 20 years. Uh, the Southwest Boise area, which has uh, developed heavily through the county following Boise's comprehensive plan, but has not annexed, uh, that area is almost built out constructed uh, interim signals out there in the mid 2000s and our first roadway project is a program for construction in 2022 so about 15 years uh, until we're actually doing one of the permanent improvements out there and then we have uh, a host of projects to follow in the in the coming years yes, I have a question just something I've always wondered about um, how do impact fees get addressed an area that is already built out. So if I'm building infill, um, not that I would do any building, but um, in an area that you know the level of service is good, there's already great connectivity. Um, how do how do you think about impact fees in those areas? Our uh, impact fee um, ordinance. We have a countywide service area, so the impact fee is the same across the county. If there's an infill project, if it's a new unit building on a vacant lot that just happened to remain vacant, then they would pay uh, the same impact fee as anybody else. And the logic behind that is that it is a system, even though they may live in this one area, they could work across the county, they may shop across the county, have other trips that take them outside. Okay. Gary. What are some of the reasons for the lag? It is the, uh, the number of demands and that um, as we all see, the, the development hits us kind of like a shotgun blast across the county. We can't hit every area at the same time, so we have to focus on um, certain corridors. You'll see later, I'll show you a map of the priority corridors our commission has established and we work to complete an entire corridor instead of just jumping to one random intersection or road segment in the middle of nowhere that doesn't connect to anything to try and provide a, a complete system. So instead of jumping out of the corridor, do you still have a dynamic prioritization that some factors might necessitate jumping or changing? Absolutely, yeah. And then I'm curious, what about North Five Mile, it seems like it was pretty aggressive and I think successful expansion uh, by Fairview. That absolutely improved north-south flow. Um, what, are the, what are the plans for extending that all the way to Chinden? The five, five lane setup. Uh, I don't believe that that's currently programmed, but that's also a good example of that lag, that area that we just widened on five mile, developed out in the 70s, 80s. Right. Yeah. Right. Thank you, sir. So the, like I said, the challenges that uh, kind of 
highlighted in that North Puna, South Meridian area. It's just kind of a preview of what we're seeing across the county, particularly uh, Southeast Meridian, that area between uh, Cloverdale and Highway 69, uh, Northwest Eagle, the City of Star, uh, and then some of the uh, planned growth areas in Boise. Uh, South Meridian, you know, they are developing the regional park there off of Lake Hazel. Um, this oval to the left of that, we've had preliminary talks with the developer that has 600 acres there ready to start work next year. CUNA has multiple subdivisions a couple miles south of here at Locust Grove and Hubbard. Um, so we're getting, uh, development is coming from both, both ends hitting this area as well. Star, this is uh, west of Pollard, north of Floating Feather, the circle there at Beacon Light and uh, New Hope. We've seen preliminary plats there for 800 to 1,000 lots uh, out off of Munger and New Hope. We've seen multiple subdivisions out there that are uh, gonna grow together there. Few stats for STAR, if uh, people aren't familiar. Uh, you know, platted over 400 lots the last couple of years, um, averaging 250 to 300 residential permits per year, so they're growing fast. Southwest Boise, uh, Syringa, I think it's now called Barnwood, over 600 acre um, specific area. Um, plan approved by the city of Boise. They're working on their first phase right now. Uh, just to the west of Cole Road, uh, another subdivision preliminary platted the Sari through the city of Boise and annexed. And the remainder of the dairy is being uh, uh, going through some preliminary planning right now and they're looking at relocating. So the problem we have in a lot of these outlying areas is that our base network just hasn't been built yet. We're still running on the two lane section line roads um, to, uh, to be able to build additional road and intersection. We will require additional revenue or a shift of our priorities that uh, Chief of Staff uh, Daigle just uh, showed you earlier in his presentation. There's only so much money to go around, so uh, the expansion of roads and intersections in that second uh, prior, prioritization category. In the North Cuna South Meridian area, we have discussed trying to look at a, a regional strategy with the cities. Uh, I highlighted these two bullets because we took those actions last year, added South 10 Mile as a priority corridor and advanced that uh, first mile of uh, 10 mile road down to Victory. It's under design uh, right now. Uh, what we could look at is some interim signals when warranted and some other focused improvements. Um, if we do make improvements to the priority corridors, it'll help redistribute traffic and provide some relief even on the parallel routes. Uh, but we would need to acknowledge that those other corridors will exceed our planning thresholds in the short and medium term if we're focusing our improvements on, on that one corridor. And this is a map of our adopted priority corridors. Uh, you can see we added South of 10 Mile Road last year. Working to address uh, issues in Southwest Boise, we're working north to south on Eagle Road Maple Grove Road, currently studying the realignment of Orchard to tie into the new connection here at Gallon. And then we would uh, begin working uh, on the intersection road segments on Lake Hazel from west to east as, uh, as we get down through there. Is that a stand for any questions you may have? I have a question. Um, are you um, getting your growth predictions from Compass, or are you running your own assumptions? We we use the demographics from uh, Compass and the Communities in Motions 2040 2.0, and then also um, 
as we approve and review traffic studies with the new developments, um, some of our data that I showed you here is from, from that as well, and, and then that gets incorporated in to the travel demand model at a later date. Here's my question, and it may be for you or the deputy director, I'm not sure. So um, just to put it kind of in our context, you know, we sit as the board of commissioners for multiple different things and multiple different levies, um, and w those finances can't cross. So I can't, we can't borrow from emergency medical to pay for weed and pest abatement and North Shore. But I'm wondering, as I think about these um, different and competing uh, issues, maintenance and growth. Do you think about property tax and impact fees that way? And are property tax essentially there to maintain roads and impact fees for new growth? I can answer part of that. Our impact fees can pay for the expansion of the roads and intersections necessitated by that growth, but it doesn't pay for the entire project. So there are uh, certain portions of these projects that have to be paid out of the general revenue. So that would come from property taxes, highway users funds, our other revenue sources. I guess what I'm trying to get at, and, and not to oversimplify it, but um, you, know, you often hear folks say growth needs to pay for itself. And I, I think um, you know that's a lot of concern that folks have when they um, are come property tax time, how much are they paying for new development that, that may be occurring? So I'm just, that's the frame that I'm thinking of. Another question. <laughs> I have a lot of them, <laughs> but um, feel free. One of them is just how do you prioritize? It looks like your, your main priority is maintenance now and the second priority is growth building. Um, how do you sort of balance that need especially with the growth that we're incurring right now. Um, you know, basically telling someone you're not going to build, you know, a wider road or whatever um, in lieu because you're going to be maintaining or repaving another one. How does that decision get made on the board level or is there a formula? It's pretty much made for us. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I mean, we have, we have a pretty detailed prioritization system uh, that we use, and maybe that's something we should share with them. Uh, but it, it, I mean, it's, it's not just throw a dart, right? There's, there's actually a, quite a process that we go through to prioritize our projects. Uh, thank you, uh, <laughs> President Arnold. Uh, commissioners, there's one more presentation we're gonna to touch on some uh, in more detail on that question specifically of a priority and how we've gotten to where we are today. And I'm glad to, to share that with you. Oh, you don't need to jump ahead. <laughs> well, certainly if there's other questions from Gary's presentation, we can stand for those. Yes, do you have other questions for Gary? Okay, thanks. Well, by way of introduction, my name is Justin Lucas. I'm the planning and programming manager here at uh, the Ada County Highway District. Um, and I was asked today to present on our strategic plan. We went through a, a very detailed strategic planning process back in 2016. And many of the questions that you are uh, asking today and, and asking for details on were key topics of that discussion back in 2016. Uh, the process was uh, over a year long and we did a pretty deep dive into, into some of these critical issues. Just to place everything in context, and, and I think this can be helpful, um, you know, there's often a lot of questions about, well, where does ACHD fit in all of the different planning and, and uh, governmental activities that happen uh, here in our county? And um, in, in, our, in our view, the city and county comprehensive plans establish the land use vision for um, this county. Uh, ACHD uh, through Compass and the regional a transportation plan, um, what happens is, is those plans are um, all kind of stitched together and through the compass process, uh, that regional transportation plan, we come up with an overall vision um, for our, uh, our county. It's really even beyond our county because the compass area, as you're very aware of, is a two county area, um, but we focus uh, in Ada County. 
um, those demographic projections and the transportation demand model that come out of that process are critical. Um, they drive a lot of decision making that happens in transportation specifically. Um, and we rely on Compass to provide us with those, uh, those very detailed demographic projections and the transportation demand model. Um, in 2016, ACHD created the strategic plan to help link uh, the work done through the city and county comprehensive plans, the communities in motion, uh, previous planning efforts that we've done with our transportation land use integration plan, all the plans we have, to try and help link all of those documents to the ACHD capital improvements plan, which is our uh, primarily a roadway and intersection expansion plan. Um, our integrated five-year work plan, which is our, uh, was previously discussed, which contains a, a project description and detailed accounting of all of the projects that ACHD is going to do over the next five years. ACHD also has a single uh, integrated operational plan, which is a staff level uh, operational document that helps guide uh, decisions uh, related to ACHD's operations. And all of those things culminate in the annual budget process uh, that ACHD goes through. Uh, this uh, planning framework uh, is unique to Ada County because it's unique to ACHD and our unique role. So I can pause there if you, and please just jump in if you have any questions or uh, thoughts or if would like more detail. I'm glad to stop at any time. Yes, I do. I'm just going to the very top one. Um, knowing that the cities may or may not have their comprehensive plans fully developed and they're always evolving and they may or may not be communicating, what challenges do you have and, and what does that sort of overall comprehensive regional vision look like um, as close as you can describe to date? Uh, uh, thank you. It's an excellent question and, and you know, due to the unique uh, land use laws in Idaho, um, you know, cities and counties are required to have a, a comprehensive plan, um, but those comprehensive plans are not constrained by time. Um, so they are comprehensive both in scope and, uh, and their time. So um, a development could be considered to be consistent with the comprehensive plan as long as it's within the planning area boundary of that city or county. Um, that creates a lot of challenges for a, a transportation agency because most of our planning is constrained by time. We're looking at either a five-year time frame or a 20-year time frame, and we plan our resources and our projects associated with growth that's anticipated within that five or 20-year time frame. And um, we really rely on that Compass uh, Communities in Motion process to help define that, that time frame and to link that to our uh, capital planning documents. Um, for example, um, it's right now we're going through a process of updating ACHD's uh, CIP. We're going to be kicking that off. Um, because of the recently adopted CIM 2042.0, we then follow that document with an update to our long range capital planning document. Um, but the cycle is kind of interesting because right when you adopt a new regional plan, you basically start uh, the process of, of building another one. Uh, which you'll be uh, likely involved in through Compass over these next several years. So that process is really critical where the regional goals are defined, the demographic projections, the modeling, and ACHD, we don't have a separate process to do that. We rely on the, the, the Compass process to help guide us uh, in that area. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Sure, I don't want to get into the, the local politics of comprehensive no, planning, no, um, but yeah, to my, to my, it's my understanding that Compass uses the city adopted comprehensive plans when they're looking at, um, yes, because that's what Compass uh, is, is using. And when a, a city is reviewing its comprehensive plan, they're reviewing the comprehensive plan that they have adopted. And that's just a reminder for me. In the development of the comprehensive plan under the Local Land Use Planning Act, there is several categories that have to be considered. The environment and everything, and the one component uh, for transportation. And what that provides is, is that in developing the comprehensive plan, you have to uh, consult with us, the local jurisdiction, uh, in developing that comprehensive plan. Uh, so that's done in coordination. We meet with your staff uh, when you guys are going to be updating the comprehensive plan. We talk about uh, what you want for transportation in the county. 
so physically, you, I mean, you have these physical, you can, you know, hard copy, if you will. Do you actually then put them all together so you actually have an entire regional vision? Uh, sure, uh, excellent question. The, absolutely. So um, when we do planning within uh, Ada County, obviously there's jurisdictional boundaries that we're very aware of. But the transportation network, to be honest, doesn't really care about jurisdictional boundaries. The network is responsive to um, you know, the needs of not only Ada County, but we obviously have a lot of uh, transportation coordination um, and uh, flow between Ada and Canyon counties. And to be honest, across the state of Idaho, because we're the, the capital area. Um, so yes, we absolutely stitch all those together. Compass has a, they're, they're called traffic analysis zones, which break down each, break down the county into very small geographic areas. And the demographic projections are provided for each traffic analysis zone. So how many jobs are expected within this area within a certain time frame? How many uh, more people are expected within this smaller geographic area within a certain time frame? That's, we have it down to that level, absolutely. Some other uh, key things coming up, um, obviously ACHD updates its integrated five-year work plan on a yearly basis. During that process, we do a lot of outreach to our partner uh, municipalities. Um, you got a letter from us uh, probably back in January. We basically ask for your priorities, um, and we do that with all of our partners. Uh, coming up in March is the deadline for, to provide those priorities back. And then we sit down with our commission, we review all of those priorities that have been requested by the cities. They play a huge part in the decision-making process that we go through on an annual basis to program, uh, to program projects. And that's something that we're really proud of our coordination there. And we recognize we really need that coordination to make good decisions about projects. Um, just some other details about you know ongoing updates to comprehensive plans, which are uh, as you as was stated, they're uh, being updated on a regular basis, um, and then that that update to CIM, which is underway. One of the big things coming out of the the strategic plan um, was a, a recognition and a reaffirmation um, that each community and each kind of geographic region within Ada County has unique transportation characteristics. This is unique in a lot of different ways, even from an asset management perspective and the age of the system, uh, unique uh, demographics and transportation needs. ACHD certainly understands this and is totally committed to context sensitive solutions. This language up on the screen is in our adopted strategic plan and the commission uh, has, uh, has directed staff to uh, entertain and search for and look for context sensitive solutions through all of our projects and really work individually with each of the communities to make sure the project is, is meeting the needs of, the, of that community. Some context, and I'll just go quickly through some of this. You've seen kind of the big stuff. Uh, this was the demographic projections from CIM 2040 uh, and also confirmed with the Department of Labor. You can see those uh, demographic projections 1995 to 2035. Uh, we're at about 470, uh, almost uh, 500,000 here in Ada County right now. That number changes every day. Um, looking out to 2025, um, on our current trajectory, uh, well over 500,000 people uh, in, in Ada County. Uh, the, will, will we stay on this trajectory? Um, it's hard to say, right? I mean, no one has a crystal ball to know exactly when uh, the economic expansion that we're currently experiencing will slow down. But if we maintain on the current track, uh, we're going to be well above 500,000 people in this valley uh, pretty quickly. And then uh, that's an addition of 80,000 people. I mean, that's basically the size of the city of Nampa. A um, little smaller than Meridian currently is. That's a, a lot of, uh, of new citizens in our county. Uh, ACHD, we break this down and we look at, well, what kind of impact does that type of population growth uh, have on our system? Uh, as was stated earlier, we're well over 5,000 lane miles. Uh, we're projecting uh, close to 5,400 lane miles by 2025. And depending on the growth scenario, you can see what that goes to by 2035, um, reaching potentially close to 6,500 lane miles of, of roadway to serve the population uh, needs that are, um, that are projected here in Ada County. That's a, a lot of growth. That's a lot of roadways and a lot of um, uh, projects that need to be done to accommodate that growth. System age, I mentioned this a little, a little earlier. Um, our county's uh, 
kind of unique in how it's uh, uh, kind of set up from a system age perspective. This isn't a surprise to anyone. But the oldest part of our, uh, of our uh, system is located in that Boise area, a lot of those areas that developed uh, uh, you know, before the 2000s. Um, and then the newest part of our system in the greens and the yellows, you can see um, in kind of south and west and northwest uh, Ada County. Um, from an asset management perspective or a maintenance perspective, this presents a lot of challenges um, because we have to be really uh, strategic in how we maintain a system. The needs in uh, downtown Boise and the, some of those uh, older neighborhoods are very different than the needs in some of these newer uh, neighborhoods. Construction standards have changed over time. Um, a lot of the uh, stormwater facilities and regulations and requirements have changed extensively over time. And that has a huge impact on the, on, the, on the maintenance burden that we face going forward. So strategically, this was brought up uh, earlier and this was uh, uh, brought forward through the uh, strategic plan and certified by our commission. This is how we approach our programming on a yearly basis. Um, determine and fund those maintenance and safety needs by asset category. Our five primary asset categories are listed there, uh, pavement, sidewalks, bridges, traffic signals and materials, and stormwater facilities. And each of those asset categories, we have kind of a comprehensive uh, inventory. Uh, we have a metric associated with each of those asset categories that we're trying to achieve based on commission direction. Um, and we would do a lot of work maintaining that inventory and maintaining all of the work we're doing so that we can make good data-driven decisions. And then the secondary focus is um, obviously enhancement of the system and congestion management and relief. It's, uh, this was brought up earlier about, you know, do we just look at pavement? Is that our only metric? And certainly it's not. Um, ACHD uh, has a comprehensive inventory of all of our sidewalk and pedestrian facilities. Um, specifically, and we're going through a process of updating our ADA transition plan right now, one of the areas we look very carefully at is our uh, uh, ADA compliance within our system, curb ramps, sidewalks, making sure that they're ADA compliant. Um, there's a lot of uh, resources required to bring older, out-of-date uh, infrastructure up to standards. Um, our bike facilities, we recently adopted a bicycle master plan addendum to our original master plan from 2009. And the, the, the point there was the commission really wanted us to focus on a low stress network. Um, there's really been a shift in bicycle planning um, over the last probably five years, moving away from the on-street bike lane to a, a facility that's more protected, that's off of those main roadways, that's safer um, uh, for, the, for the user. Uh, stormwater presents a giant challenge for ACHD. We have the largest stormwater system in the state of Idaho. Um, and as stated, there's a, a lot of uh, increasing environmental regulations associated with that activity. And we are working hard to uh, build a better inventory of our stormwater network and, um, and make sure that we're complying with those regulations. And then traffic signals, materials, and all of the sidewalk and other maintenance that we do. There's a lot going on. And this is one of my pet peeves really is when, when people think of a maintenance project, they think of um, maintaining the pavement. Actually, whenever we go maintain the pavement, we're actually doing an evaluation of all of these different uh, categories when we do a maintenance project. So it's something like 25 or 35, 30% of our um, pavement maintenance projects go towards other things that have nothing to do with the actual road. They're going into stormwater upgrades, ADA compliance, and things like that. So this is just uh, another example of one of the primary focus areas of the commission, which is our community programs. Um, the commission has directed uh, approximately six to eight million dollars per year be spent on sidewalk and bicycle specific projects and specifically safe routes to school. So these are these are sidewalk and uh, bicycle uh, projects that are um, not associated with a roadway uh, widening project. These are very specific. These are retrofit projects, filling sidewalk gaps, um, adding crossings and working with the school districts to provide infrastructure to eliminate safety busing. Um, there's a lot of work and thought that goes into this area on an annual basis. Um, there was, we have a lot of metrics associated with this area. In the introduction to our integrated five-year work plan, you can see a lot of discussion about how many projects have we identified? How many have we completed? Um, what, are, what is our neighborhood plan uh, status for this uh, next year? Uh, we do a lot of work in this area that we're really proud of and have received a lot of accolades, um, not only from uh, kind of nationally, but from our communities on the work that we do in this area. 
Uh, secondary focus, and this has been talked quite a bit about today, and I just wanted to end with that updated uh, priority corridors map. Uh, this is based on you know, ACHD's uh, vision to try and create a transportation network that's functional for all users. Um, we, uh, there was a question brought up earlier about who do we think about, who we're thinking about is the traveling public, anybody who's traveling, um, because uh, whether they're uh, riding transit, uh, using a bicycle, uh, driving, which is obviously the largest uh, section of those people that use our network, um, they need the roadway, they need the right of way um, to make those trips. And we do our best to maintain it in good condition and provide a system that is uh, reliable, uh, a system that is um, uh, balanced between the different modes. Um, and uh, that's one of the big focuses of, of this priority corridor map. We recognize we can't do it all, and we certainly can't build our way out of congestion, and we talk about that a lot. But we also recognize that there are key projects needed to build a system and a network that's functional. So I think that's my uh, last slide. I'm certainly glad to stand for any questions or comments you may have. Without getting too far into the weeds, it may warrant a different discussion. But in, in my neck of the woods, I have a lot of folks asking me, I'm sure as you guys get, people get confused between Ada County and Ada County Highway District. So, so that I have an answer. Um, I have a lot of folks asking me about State Street and you know what the vision is. and. I'm hearing about bus rapid transit, and I am I'm assuming that these areas are being created to accommodate that. Can you talk to that project a little bit so I'd be better informed? Yeah, I'd be glad to, and thank you for the opportunity. So um, the, the State Street corridor was identified um, as a, a special corridor about uh, 10 to 12 years ago through the adoption of the State Street Traf transit and traffic operations plan. We call it the TTOP. Um, and that plan uh, basically designated um, projects, not only from the roadway uh, kind of expansion and enhancement side, but from the transit side also. So there's an anticipation that over time, um, transit uh, activity will increase on that corridor as it's funded through uh, valid regional transit. Um, and ACHD is uh, committed to building projects that support um, that transit activity along that corridor. Um, so we have, um, through our targets, we've, uh, there's been some major enhancements recently on that corridor. The State Street and Veterans Memorial Parkway intersection. Currently underway is the State Street and Collister intersection, which is a federally funded project. Um, and then we have a few other projects planned um, on that corridor. Uh, to this point, the commission has not directed us to include the widening of State Street to the full seven lane cross section. Um, yet, that's what's called for um, in the transit and traffic operations plan. Uh, there's various triggers uh, required to uh, make that happen and further coordination and discussion about when it's appropriate to do that and when um, the transit infrastructure will be ready uh, to uh, match some of the other enhancements that are being done on the corridor. Okay, so bottom line, we're not going to have to redo things when bus rapid transit comes in, or we are. Um, I think that's a, a, a good question. Because the, the, the specific design of the bus rapid transit has not been determined yet by um, Valley Regional Transit, we've worked closely with them. Uh, the, to my knowledge, the funding hasn't been allocated to, uh, to go in that direction yet. And so would there be some minor reconfiguration or, 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 or changes needed to some of those things? It's, it's possible. I, I really wouldn't know until they decide exactly how they want to approach the bus rapid transit on that on that corridor. It is prioritized though, right, in the Communities of Motion Plan? Uh, yes, uh, State Street is one of the top priority uh, corridors um, within Communities in Motion. I think the biggest challenge um, related to uh, funding uh, of that corridor is a dedicated source of funding for transit in general um, and, and providing um, a dedicated source that is uh, used for transit operations within the county. And BRT is, we're full partners, and, and they were full partners within the, the State Street TTOP, and we coordinate with them on a regular basis on these issues. What's the difference between um, your commuter ride and BRT? It seems like you're both in the public transportation business. <laughs> Commute. We have no buses with commuter ride. They're just vans. It's a van pool operation. Uh, commuter ride, 
been sanctioned by the RT to operate and full operation I think the last 13 years or so. Uh, and we have a contract with the BRT that allows that uh, oh, okay. meter to operate. It's probably the most successful way to full operation. Uh, but that was a conversation recently, wasn't it? To sort of change that. The, the conversation recently was to change the model and they decided not to do that at this time. So. on that topic all right the next item is discussion items open discussion so, so anything? Uh, you guys have some money for us to figure out how to pay for a new org you can <laughs> <laughs> I have been reading about that yeah it exists yeah. <laughs> yeah. trying to figure out that in here has to have has to add yeah. trying to figure out the relationship roads. between yeah. That and they won't have to drive anymore. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's true. They oh. So, Rebecca, going back to your funding model, um, what percentage of your funding is uh, comes through Compass and into ACHD, if any? Well, those are federal funds, um, primarily. I don't know the number off the top of my head. Yeah, it's it's approximately eight million dollars per year that ACHD receives through um, through Compass. And that, uh, those dollars support ACHD's uh, asset management program specifically. And so we plan on using those dollars and they supplement our, our maintenance activities. Uh, once again, it's not just pavement maintenance, it's a whole array of upgrades and, and, and to, our, uh, to our system. And that was a decision made by the Compass Board uh, several years ago by policy to allocate those dollars towards maintenance activities. And I assume we uh, participate in grants, identifying and writing grants collaboratively? Are there any grants on the horizon that we're looking at going after? Um, I, I'm trying to think of the last time Ada County and ACHD worked uh, hand in hand on a grant. There's not a lot of, um, there are some competitive grants uh, that, that are available for transportation. Most of those are gone after uh, by ITD. The projects that are most successful in the grant arena are big regional projects, for example, like the widening of I-84 in Canyon County, that was a successful grant recipient. But those are often projects that are $100 million, $200 million projects. What was the cost on that one? It was about $90 million. It was, yeah, the infra grant was $90 million that was received, yes. Which freed up funds for the state to use in other uh, areas. Which was uh, initiated by ACHD, but it became a 
a countywide collaborative effort. But we never could get the different jurisdictions on board with adopting um, ordinances to define what adequate public uh, facilities were. So it it's, has stalled until the various jurisdictions decide they want to go down that road. Yeah, and I guess I'm just interested in um, the, the players have changed at this table, but also also around the county. And I don't know if we have an opportunity to re, I, I've asked that very sincerely. I don't know if we have an opportunity to reinvigorate that conversation. Um, you, know, you all went through the campaign process and um, I think for, for me, it was on the tip of everybody's tongue was growth and kind of there, some of it's a vis visceral reaction like in terms of how we're, how people feel about this this growth. Um, I do know that um, there's just a sense that we need to get ahead of it better, and, and I don't have all the answers for how to do that, but I'm really, from a philosophical perspective, very open to engaging with you all about what that might look like. It'd be a good time to re-engage. Yeah, we're Start certainly open on. to um, continuing the conversation uh, that started with the blueprint for good growth. Steve, did you have something to add to yeah, that? Yeah, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, when this about five years ago, maybe six, it kind of stalled out on the adequate public facilities. ACHD had kind of, we initiated it, it then kind of took its, its own life form. Uh, but it, towards the end, it was decided that Compass would house basically uh, I think Commissioner Hansen is uh, on that. I don't know if they meet regularly. Uh, Mayor Peter is I think, still the president of that effort. Um, so we always left it kind of in park so that if it ever, there was ever an interest to ta tackle that again, that that, that um, would be there. But you know, we're always uh, in, in very interested in coordinated infrastructure development with growth. And we realized how expensive it is from our perspective. And that's why we initiated it, where we're constantly <coughs> responding to land use decisions that are inconsistent with comprehensive plans. Um, you know, they all of a sudden, as Costco comes in, and that's an enormous uh, deviation from what we have planned, and so we have to respond quickly, and then we have that time frame. And so we're very interested in it. The commission's always been, uh, we spent a lot of money on it at the beginning and very supportive of that because the taxpayers of ACHD would benefit greatly. Absolutely. My understanding is that if that's a nonprofit that is still housed under uh, campus it's just dormant yeah. yeah but it could be reinvigorated yeah no idea any other thoughts on that or is there anything i'm missing or there's probably a lot i'm missing <laughs> <laughs> just, i am short so <laughs> well i would just um echo what diana said i'm really interested in working with our partners and going back and dusting that off i think it's been on the shelves for far too many years and Let's get it, yeah, get it back out and, and get the right parties at the table and have our have the first dialogue around what that would look like. I totally forward. support that. Yeah, I think the people are moving here because of a quality of life, and, and the danger is that we lose that quality of life in the, in the midst of that. And I don't think we have to go that that road to use a pun for you all. Um, I'm killing Kendra with all my puns all the time. Um, but it's gonna require some changes in the way we do business and probably some political will mm -hmm. to be real. Um, so we have yeah. a good, fresh approach. Mm -hmm. Do you see a lot of new players? So I think the timing is perfect. The stars have aligned. Yeah. <laughs> because it was some of the stuff that changed during the election was brought up. I was really grateful that uh, three of the four uh, 
admission candidates asked me if I would come to some of their town hall meetings uh, for the specific purpose of them being able to defer transportation related questions to somebody other than themselves. And uh, I was dumbfounded at how, what the percentage was of questions that related to transportation. And, uh, uh, and you were all really good about that. And there was never anything negative. And so I, I look forward to a real positive experience. Well, people think that we're you, so we yeah. want to all present in a good light. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. How about a name change? Yeah. <laughs> Treasure Valley. Well, I we can look at that. <laughs> thank you. All so right, much anything else? Us. Well, thank you for being here. Um, I'd like to have these meetings on a regular basis, yeah. but if you feel the need to meet with us or if a topic comes up, please pick up the phone because we're always open to sitting down with you, whether it's it's in a formal setting like this or over coffee. Yeah. Talk about anything that comes up. So even thank you for the yeah. opportunity. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. And I will be reaching out. I'm just I'm okay. letter right letter. now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I Sorry, I already took care of that. <laughs> And then we can through. mail you yes. our email. You it must be like your presentation. Yeah, so we'll get a little bit more control and I'll reach out a little coffee. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And you too as well, Mary. All right. Yeah. But I think we need to have that as a priority to re-engage. Oh, absolutely. With that, yeah. dust it off. Because of the growth, actually, people will be motivated. Okay, so I'm going to call this meeting officially adjourned. Thank you. Yeah, I think they got fatigued. Yeah, planning. It was just.